And so really and truly, that situation can also change with us as well. We've got to be prepared, especially as the system of the Dajjal is coming. You see, what is the system? What are the characteristics of the Dajjal according to the narrations? Look in your seat. Does that apply to you today, living in the West? You see, they say the Dajjal comes with two things. The first thing the Dajjal comes with is shakwa, desires. Forces people to follow their desires. So I want to ask you, Look around your society today. The entire Western world, in fact, thanks to globalization, is based upon the nafs, the idea of your desires. What's the second thing that Jal comes with? According to the tradition, the second thing is music. So you've got your desires and you've got music going side by side. Now let me give you an example. Switch on the television. Look at an advert. Look at the Gillette advert for men's ratings. What do you see? You see a half-naked woman and music in the background. Look at any product today. What do you see? David Beckham in his underwear? Or a woman half-naked? Music in the background. You can't switch on your television without hearing music in the background. And today, the way that we desensitized is that all of our youth are debating is this halal music, is this haram, okay, music is okay, it's alright. Half of the nasheeds today, well, I say half, less than half of the nasheeds today, if you look at them, it's in the way of music as well. And people don't understand that. You know, I remember myself, uh, in Bonn, every restaurant you'd go into, there used to be this music in the background, right? And so for one month, two months, obviously you can't help it, so you go in there, you're buying some food. For six months continuously, one tune is going, Mahara comes along. One of the brothers who recites very famous, I'm not going to mention his name, he makes an entire piece of poetry, Abu Fab, on this music. Now you tell me according to the most, vast majority of the Maharaja, this is haram. And this is where you're finding a lot of these in the shop. It almost seems like pop music. We're desensitized to this. Now go to the narrations and you'll see. According to a particular narration that says from the 6th of Allah, Islam, it says that if you have music in your house, if you have drums in your house, flute in your house, and this is what is coming in the narration, but what is the principle? The principle is music, right? For 40 days, Baraka goes away from your house. Meaning what? Trials and tribulations come. Family problems come. Financial problems come. When Allah removes His mercy, all of these problems begin to come. Now you don't necessarily need a piano in your house. It's the music when you switch on the television, which are then What are musical instruments today? Small things, MP3 players. But the problem is that we're not investigating. It's so easy for us to say, well, look, you know what? We're living in the West, come on. Many times when we look at this idea that some of our youth said, well, this is halal music. Well, is it actually halal? Have you gone and researched? What did Allah Raja say on this? It's not as easy as this. If there's music which resembles that, which is Latin music, the stuff that you're playing in your nightclubs, there's some machines with the same kind of beats. So now tell me, look, again, it's a taqlid issue, go and follow your knowledge. But the reality is be cautious. Be a person who's cautious. Do ihtiyat on these issues as well. Because if you look at it, it erodes your belief. It erodes this iman that you have. Years of you trying to preserve this your parents. You know what the parents say come and they say, in our day, music was absolutely haram. And today you find that, okay, I, the youth are saying that we can listen to this or we can listen to that. What do we say to our youth? And this is another issue which is now transpiring. That at the time of your parents, it was something different, and now it's something different. And again, okay, fine, we can say this is an evolutionary process that takes place in jurisprudence. But really look at the letters and the rulings and do ihtiyat sometimes. The child attracts you to the narration. Through music, he puts you in a false state of love. And you know what happens? You find that you become more frustrated as well. You forget the world around you. Look at the newspapers, what do you see? Look at the magazines, everything is gossip. And we looked at it two days ago. And that person who gossips is the most wretched of a person. The torment, the alarm, the grave for a person who listens to gossip. What is gossip? News, akhbar, khabar. What is it? Me or you going to somebody and saying to them, Hey, did you hear? What? They're having problems with their family. That's gossip. They're going through a divorce. Something that this kind of news, vain news, it's not worth it. And today, look at our culture. You open up, you go to any superstore, 
If you look at the newspapers, and I've seen this, look at all of the main newspapers. All of the front pages, what? This is gossip. It's celebrity culture. It's useless. It's, this is what's fueling. This is the system of the Dajjal. You know, what's happening in the world? Nobody knows. The massacre which is taking place in Sayyidah Zaylan, nobody knows. Ask the average person today. Ask them, what's happening in the world of Hollywood? They'll tell you exactly what's happening. What's happening in East End business today? Everybody knows what's happening. Or at least most people know of a particular age group. False uh, sense of love. We don't actually know what the news is. We don't know the reality of what's happening. We're worried about these things. Go to the tube. How many times and speaking to a lot of brothers, you go on the tube, you go on the train, you go on the bus. If the age group is between 11 and 18, right, what they're talking about is my girlfriend and my boyfriend and these problems. And if the over 21 is about divorces and it's about affairs and it's about relationships, that's all, is this conversation? Is this what the world has come to? Is this the Western world? Is this what we're reading today? This idea of advancement is going completely out of the window. Is that what we're doing? And this is building within us as well. It has an impact. Our ladies, if you look at it, who are dressed in hijab, our men were meant to be observing hijab. What are you seeing today? Free mixing going on. You know this? The zinam, different categories, right? You know, we're not talking about the absolute one, which obviously as far as followers of that one they wouldn't be involved in and per the narration of the Imam alayhi salam it says that people with the who are the who are followers of Abu al they don't involve themselves as enough. But if you look at it, look at the mixing. You know what's destroyed our society recently of late? Facebook. Honestly, it's a double-edged tool. You can use it for good and you can use it for bad. Do you know how many ladies who in proper hijab the pictures there? Even if you make it private, it takes one person on that private list to go and download it, and the next thing you know, women's hijab is gone. And poking, and winking, and flirting, and it's all happening by the computer. And it's destroying our society, it's destroying our marriages, it's destroying our systems, it's destroying our youth. You know, you tell me, before Facebook you find that our sisters were more chaste in that way. And I'm not saying don't use it, use it. But be very careful what you do. Be muraqib on yourselves. And this is why there's such a big emphasis on muraqib. You know, there's an entire book that's been written on these things. The idea to be vigilant of yourself. Don't feed into the system because the system will bite back at you. And this is why it says that when the Imam finally does come, those people who have been entranced by this Dajjali system, that they won't be able to scratch. And this is where the veils come, this is where the doubt comes. This is why this lack of belief comes. This is why you find that we are moving away from the deen. This is why we're going more towards materialism. Because we're living in a society based upon the nafs. You need to destroy these idols. You need to come back to the truth. Otherwise you're not preserved. You know, at least the ulama of Akhlaq say that at least once you go to Ziyarah, go to Najaf, go to Karbala, go to Pongas, go somewhere, do something spiritual. This is why there's a narration that says that if a person, and he does once every 40 days go and see an alim al Rabbani, his heart dies. It's a narration. The emphasis to go to see Alam al Rabbani, a godly scholar, once every 40 days, otherwise your heart dies. These are real things. And do we do them? Do we take them seriously? No. In fact, we're anti ulama these days. And we give the excuse that look, when the Imam comes, 7,000 ulama's heads will be shot off. And you feel like, wow. Can I ask you a question? Do you know how many scholars there are in Pormen Najaf alone? Do you know the number over 50,000? That's just over there, right? Do you want to go outside of that? Do you know how many scholars there are worldwide? Possibly half a million. So now tell me, it's 7,000 a lot. In honesty, when you hear this narration, you've got 25,000 Iranian ulama studying at Al Nepal. You've got approximately 15,000 foreign students. You've got other one who are known as Fara al Tehsilu over there. That's only in one city. Go throughout Iran, go through Iraq, go through Syria, go to Lebanon, look at this country. When you take all of the scholars, how many do they number? So you're saying 7,000? If you look at it, sometimes it's almost enough to say that it's, it's not even a percentage. 
and people criticize. Okay, maybe there may be some very powerful ones, but don't characterize everyone like that and say all of them are corrupt. It's not the case. There are some very pious ones, otherwise this narration wouldn't be there. And Allah's Allah, this ground is never clean of Awali Allah and Allah Rabbani. So it says once every 40 days visit an Allah Rabbani, otherwise your heart dies. There's a connection with the religion. In the occultation of the time of Ghaybah, you know, and you've noticed that the entire religion is based upon this institution today, which we call Malatayya. Whatever happens, it is our responsibility to stick to that because it's the best that we have. You're still better off. Go to the other denominations and see how they've destroyed themselves. At least with our youth, whatever happens, they come back to the right path again eventually at some stage. Whether it's in Muharram, whether it's in Ramadan. Look at the other youth that you see. What are they involved in? Look at the corruption which they're involved in. Look at the other religions. At least one thing we can say. Despite all of the problems we have, we're better off than all the rest. Believe me. Christianity, look at the churches, they're empty. Judaism, they're secular. Buddhist, once you're over 40, you decide to go and meditate. How many people do you find them? Okay, even within, even within Islam. If we say today Islam is the second largest religion in the world, coming close to 2 billion Muslims, let's say, tell me, how many of them are active? For if they were active today, people wouldn't be looking up at Tashayu whenever there's a problem. In the last 30 years, whenever there's a problem in Islam, even the other brothers, other world looks up at the ulama of Tashayu. Haven't you seen this? Maybe now there's a problem, but whether it's in Islam, whether it's in Lebanon, whether it's in other parts of the world, whether it's in Pakistan, even in India, who comes forward, ulama? Who's preserved this religion? There's always someone there. So honestly speaking, there's a system in place. We need to attach onto that system. We need to engineer ourselves. We need to prepare ourselves. It's really what's critical at the moment. You know, don't be too harsh upon your own people. That's what we're trying to say. Attach onto the system. This is something which is godly. This is something which has been introduced by the Imam. Stick very close to the sayings of the Imam. Refrain as much as you can. Try and move yourself out of the system of the job that we're talking about. Gossiping, this idea of celebrity culture. You see, it leads you to destruction. And so here we are, we need to prepare. What has God given us? God has given us months like this. In fact, throughout the whole 12 months for the khas, which are you guys, God's given you three months. You know what those three months are? Rajab, Shaban, Ramallah. You see, now everything that God does, He does for a reason. From 12 months, three have been made. What's the significance of these months? On a micro level and on a macro level, significance. Just like the entire year we have 12 months, you find mankind is also going through three cycles as well. There's a Rajab in civilizations, there's a Shaban in civilization, there's a Ramadan in civilization. The period we're going through at the moment is the period of Shaban. The Bahur of the Imam is a period of Ramadan. The pinnacle of perfection is Laylat al Qadr. And Eid comes to Day of Judgment. And it's a deep philosophy, and we'll inshallah look at this tomorrow. But I want to just look at this. What does, for us in this day, what does Rajab Shaban or Ramadan symbolize? Go deeper and say, okay, these months are for the khas. These months are the months where you make spiritual progress. These months are those months which are, have been made mushakas, and these months are those special months. But look at it in this light. Everything is done for a reason. What does Rajab stand for? In the entire month, and there is a tradition that also says that this month is also the month of God. But in the entire month of Rajab, one thing stands out. And if you look at all of the du'as, all of the du'as are very personal. Shaban, they become very social. But Rajab, all of the du'as are personal. It's a personal connection with God. No, go deeper than that. Month of Rajab is famous for one reason. Why? Because in that month you find one personality who comes forward. And that personality is Amir al-Mu'min islam The entire month is specific for him. The month of Rajab therefore is the month of Wilaya. The month of Rajab is the month of Amir al-Mu'min. That month therefore is this. And it's telling us this. That when you are ascending towards God, the very first thing which is important is the fact that you sought out the system of Wilaya. 
If you are a proper Muslim, if you are a proper follower of the Ahlul Bayt, the first thing that you need to go through is Wilaya. And the first door that you need to go through is the Amir al door. Your Aqeedah needs to be strong. Your understanding needs to be strong. This Wilaya is very important. Rajab, that's what it symbolizes. It symbolizes your personal connection. And I'll give you a narration. Amir al on the battlefield. The battle is the Abdullah comes forward. Now he thinks, you know, this is the Imam of the time. And if I ask him a question, he's going to have to answer it. And it's the battlefield. And so if I ask him this question, it will take maybe 23 hours. And so we can kill him. And then Abdullah then begins to work out. Who's this Imam? All of the knowledge is found in this person. He's a Hakim to the absolute. And as he begins to walk, this person comes and he says, Ya Ali, tell me. What is Islam? An Imam, as he puts one foot on one saddle and the other one on the other, beautiful couplet that today opens up volumes. He says, look, Islam is two things. He says, your duty to God and your duty to humanity was salam. He sat back and he thought about it. And you see, everything is encompassed in there. What does Rajab represent? Your duty to God, your personal connection with the Creator. And you go through this Rajab. Building this connection. Look at the doors. Everything is so personal. It's personal connection. It's the idea that humanity is going through a period of rajah. And then you shift, and the next month comes Shabbat. You know what Shabbat is about? It's a social month, it's a month of revolution. I don't say this. Look at all of the personalities. You know the first personality in Shabbat? Say the Shabbat. You know the next personality? Abu Fadl al You know the next personality? Imam Zadim Abdul Nilayson. Do you know the final personality? Master of the Times. Who are all of these personalities? From all of the Ayyamah, from all of Abdul Bayt. You find the revolutionaries of these, and you find all of them in one month. All of those people who made a social change. Save the Shuhada, led a revolution that will always be remembered until the final days. Abu Fadl Abbas showed what? With the idea of being a true follower of the Imam. What did Imam Zayn al do? Take this message forward. It's social. In 34 years of his Imam, if you look at the fourth Imam, what do you find him? You find him the way that he's passing on this message, the way that he's engrossed, the way that he's giving the rights of the people. And then finally it comes to the final revolutionary, the greatest of all revolutionaries, who will bring peace on earth. And that's the twelfth Imam of Islam. And so in this way, when you look at Shabbat, it's a month of selflessness. And if you look at all of the du'as, Open them up and see. What are you praying for? You're praying for the Imam. You're praying for your connection. You're praying for the people. You're praying for society. You're praying for all of these things. Social. The idea that when you've understood and you've made your aqidah firm and you've got this wilaya within you, the second stage now is to the people. What have you done for God? Sayyidina Shahada gave all of his life and everything. Abu Fadl al gave everything. Both of his arms gave everything that he had. What have you done? We can't even put our hands into our pockets and take out money for good causes. And so you know Islam gives a solution to that as well. And it says, if you give a tenner, you'll have half failure. So give 50p first. Give one pound first, learn that. You give 10 pounds, you give 15 pounds, you know, you might end up in hospital. So start a little bit and then develop it up. Give. Write to your name as well, that on the Day of Judgment you can say, I've written my name as well in this. There's so many things that we can give up, and we're not doing it. Time, resources, social, helping people. You know, you go into your society today, as time is going, you're finding the population is growing older. People are not now taking care of their elders. Those fundamentals of Islam to go and help the elderly, help children, to be kind, to be compassionate, all of these are going on. This is the revolution of Shabbat, to change us, to give us the opportunity to help other people. You've got Allah on one side, you've got the idea of selflessness of the khidmah on the other side. And then you're anticipating, and you've been told, fast for three days. And these three days of fasting is what? Purification. That hell becomes haram on you, if you do it properly. And then after that, you connect that one to Ramadan. And now look at it. And you find Ramadan is what? Allah. Now, Allah has given nisbah to himself for this month. And there's very few times that he does that. If you look at the narrations, you don't find it. 
You know, he says, for example, Man alafa nafsa faqad alafa abba. That's Rabdo. That's one of his names. Not his absolute name. He doesn't say you can understand me as God, my Lord. He doesn't say you can understand all of my sifat. Af'al, he doesn't say that. He says that it's only one kind of rububiya, that's if you come close to that. But here he gives the significance. He says this one is Allah's one. Allah is the smijanka. It brings together all of the names and the attributes to one platform. So there's something very great in this. The night's in itself a manifestation. Tajalliyat of Allah. Why is it? Shahullah. Because Kitab Allah was delivered on this one. And Allah gives this book in this Kitab Allah. You know, as they say with mysticism, you find that all of the universe, scattering of the universe, are just manifestations of the names of Allah. That when all of these names are brought to one platform, it was brought forward in the form of the Surah of Al Insan al Kamil, who was Adam. After all of the universe was created, the final species was Adam then. And so this is why when a lot of people ask us, well, what about the dinosaurs? There's no contradiction there. Because Adam was first in, as human beings, as the human. But in reality, he was the polish of the universe, he was the absolute manifestation of Allah. That's what it is. And in the same way, Allah gives nisbah now to this month. That is nights our worship. It seconds our worship. Every breath that you're doing, breathing is worship. So understand the significance of these nights. And this is exactly what I wanted to build up to. Because in this time, where there is so much in Herat, where the people are going off the track, where there is concentration against you, where the media is against you, media against you in a sense that everything is diverting you away from God. We've been created to go towards Tawheed, and what you find is Kathra. Everywhere around is multiplicity. In the words of Allah Sallallahu you need to go deeper than that. You need to see unity in the multiplicity. Wahdat and Kathra and Kathras be Wahdat. This idea that you're going back to unity, Tawheed basically. But our society has been created for multiplicity. And so you've been created to go back from all of this multiplicity, from all of this ways of diverting you, to go back to Tawheed. This is what Ramadan is about. This is why the nights of this month are blessed. What are the nights? What is the difference between daytime and nighttime then? Daytime symbolizes multiplicity, nighttime symbolizes unity, nighttime symbolizes the weak. And so in this way you've been told them what at night time. Break these idols somehow, concentrate again, take your focus back to a pivotal focus. And so that's why you have this month. It's the development process. It brings everything together. It brings Shaban and Rajab together this month. And so this month is, if you look at it, super Wilayati month. This month is the month of Surah Qadr. Surah Qadr is Surah Wilayah. This month is the month of the Imam al This month is the month of your connection and your ascension. This month is the month of certainty. This month is the month of Ish. It's the month of love. And so now we've been given that opportunity to utilize this. This month is why? Because of Kitab al being sent upon the heart of the Prophet. And now, the debate is in this, that was the entire Quran revealed in this month, and if it's so, and what's the point of 23 years? And, you know, these debates have been touched, and inshallah, maybe we'll touch on tomorrow very slightly. But the idea that this Quran is revealed in the heart of the Prophet, whether it's in the Bafum form, in the concept form, whether it's in the full form, and Atullah Jawadi has a, 10 lectures on this, you can find them a couple of years ago, we touched the entire ideas of this. But you see, the reality is it's the Qur'an, and what's the Qur'an itself? The Qur'an is Kalam Allah, Qur'an is manifestation. You see, there's two Qur'ans in the month of Ramadan, which are very significant. If you look at the sayings of Allah, Allah he says this, this is the two Qur'ans. One Qur'an was revealed and the other one was taken out, to expand it. One Qur'an was revealed on the night of Qadr, the other one was taken out. What does he mean by this? He means that when Allah had his, when he manifested his nur into Kalam, he created the Qur'an. When he manifested into Bashar, he created Amir al-Mu'minin. It says one Qur'an was revealed, the other one, Amir al-Mu'minin was taken up again. So in this way there's a dual connection here, one with Ahlul Bayt, one with the Qur'an. Both of these things are important for us to take side by side. This is what this month symbolizes. This is your connection with the Prophet and Ahlul Bayt on the one hand, on the second hand, which you find is the connection of the Qur'an. Of that Qur'an which contains the entire universe. Of that Qur'an that every line of it is a manifestation. 
you look at the tradition, 70,000 layers even within that, or according to some 70 layers. That's that Quran. That Quran that has significance for you in your life. And I'll give you an example, right? Imagine if a person reads this book and digests it. And you know, when you first start reading it, and let's say you haven't read it for a long time, and it happens to people in our communities, they haven't read it for a long time, or Ramadan comes in, they've got to finish the Quran. And the first day you knock back 50 verses and you feel good about yourself. And the second day, 45. Third day, 40. By the fifth day, five verses and you leave it. And you think it's a burden. Now look at those people who are Ahlullah. You see, even if you're reciting three verses, right, continuity is very important. Quran then begins to speak to you. This pleasure involved in this Qur'an. But the Qur'an doesn't reveal itself onto you. You're not mapped to the Qur'an yet. It's like you need to court the Qur'an. Courting, basically. It's like you go to marriage or like you court. In the same way you court the Qur'an, you spend time, you invest in it, you have a pure heart. You purify yourself, you purify your heart, you repent. Now talk to the Qur'an. Read a couple of verses. Build a relationship. Noor. Quran is Noor. That light will be manifested on your heart. And in this way, imagine a youth. Imagine this child, for example, sitting there. Imagine how young he is. Imagine at the age of 15, 16, 17, every single day he reads the Quran. And I'm not saying read the whole Quran, 10 verses, 15 verses. Imagine now he's reading the Quran, but every time he reads it, he dedicates it to the master of the times. Imagine when the label of Qadr comes and everything is open. Imagine that every Thursday comes and your books are open on that day. Imagine when the master of the times looks at your work in front of you and he says, Look, this person has dedicated to me 365 Qur'ans every time he reads it, every verses, every single day he's reading, he's dedicating to me. Imagine the age which you will have. Now imagine at the age of 15 or 16 you start reading the Qur'an. By the time you come to the age of 30, you'll be much better off than the society outside of you because you will be protected by the nur of the Qur'an. So we are, this is why we need to give it significance. The Qur'an then becomes ahl to you, it gives you messages, you start reading it, you start feeling a buzz, you start feeling that yes, there is a God, you start feeling a connection. This is why it's a living miracle. It's a manifestation of the Creator. Attach yourself to it. There's no side effects in the Qur'an. It's like what Abdul Abdul Karim Kashiri said. He says there are three things that have no side effects, inshallah. We'll look at them tomorrow. But one of them is the Quran. Read it and build that. This is the only way you're going to get to that point. So if you go home today, just remember one verse, two verse, three verses. Look, don't exhaust yourself by reading loads and then giving up. Have this continuity. When the pleasure comes, you'll automatically then increase. And so really, if you want to be protected from the system of the Dajjal, Qur'an is the only way, because Qur'an is Nur. And the other way, al bayt By taking both of these two things together, what you will find is you will be preserved and you will be protected. <coughs> Don't underestimate these times. Don't underestimate what's happening. Don't underestimate how quickly situations can change. In a second, a situation can change, and the next thing you know, you're stuck. The next thing, what happened? We were sleeping. Where's the shape you to go and you don't? It's not about you don't know. You do know, but that preparation needs to be there. Let's pray to Allah that He accepts our worship today and for the next coming days that He forgives our sins in this month because we don't know when the opportunity will come again. That Allah gives us the opportunity to utilize these months. That He makes us true servants of the Imam. That Allah gives success to the center. At the same time, he makes us all part of the army of the Imam, Qadr's and Sana.